if you did visit this conference exactly more or less two years ago, you had the opportunity to listen to our next speaker here at Malmö Live. He shared very interesting thoughts and conclusions on, uh, and models on how to value different kinds of companies in this new modern technology time of age uh, and how technology affected the market value of companies. Today he will share that research aside other research uh, to all of us. We're delighted to have you back, Mr. Bill Ribaudo from Boston, and uh, your company is Deloitte Digital Risk and Financial Advisory. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I often like to um, also introduce myself um, a little bit of a different way. Um, I like to describe myself as a student of corporate value. I've actually been studying what has been happening to the value of corporations for over 20 years. If you read things that I uh, wrote or were written about me 23 years ago, you would say at the end of this conversation, you would say, well, Bill, nothing much changed. You've been saying the same thing for 20 plus years. But what has changed is the new technologies that are available that have actually accelerated uh, the changes that we're seeing. So let me present what some of that looks like. And then let me propose an if-then statement. Because when I'm done with the if, then we're going to talk about some thens. What I mean by this is that if what I am going to tell you is true, I think it is, and if you believe it to be true, then it has some very large implications. And we'll discuss those kind of in the second half of, of what I will present. Um, one of the problems that exists today in the corporations is this trend that these new tech-based business models, and I'm going to define what I mean by a business model, these new tech-based business models are beginning to blur industry lines. It's becoming more difficult to tell what industry a company is in, especially these kind of tech company, right? And just think about all the, la the names we have, right? In FinTech and retail, it, it's telling you that. Two, what's happening is it is bifurcating company valuations. There are companies in the public markets that are getting a lot of capital, they have very high stock prices, and there are companies that aren't. Why is that happening and what's the issue or the solution associated with it? But what these new tech-based business models are doing is they are constraining the growth of traditional businesses. Now, there are a lot of people that you know, will <clears throat> stand up and talk about X industry is going away, everything is going to become digital. We don't have to talk about that. All we have to do is understand, is there pressure against traditional industries as a result of new tech entrance? If you want to hurt a business, you don't have to kill it. All you need to do is take a piece of its growth away and you will significantly damage the value of that business. I didn't even say declining sales, just take away a piece of the growth. Tell the analysts that our business is gonna grow slower tomorrow than it's been growing and what happens to the value of the business. So it doesn't take much for that to happen. We don't have to be Something's going away, something's you know, being destroyed, just a little bit. So the industry lines are blurring. There's a bifurcation of value, which is giving an awful lot of capital to these tech-based business models. And it is putting a constraint on the growth, which is very dangerous for all the companies that have been around for 50 or 100 years. <clears throat> so sometimes what I like to do is ask the question, what is digital. I mean, think about the situation. You're standing in a room and someone says, we're going digital. Do you know what that person means? We're going digital. We're going to be, you know, digital, it, it's actually become an overused term. It's become so ubiquitous that we don't know what it means anymore. It's like the word transformation. So let me define two kinds of digital. There's digital in the business, 
And then there's digital as the business. Digital in the business is an in investment in largely IT or anything we want to consider that's technology based that makes the business better, faster, cheaper. Digital as the business is a different business model where it cannot operate without digital technologies. An example, a simple examples of the first one might be a big box retailer, any retail organization that uses a point of sale system in order to check you out. That piece of technology is digital in the business, right? It makes that business, because if it, if it went down, you could still pay cash, write down a credit card, you could still transact business. But if you took, again, simple example, but you took something like the, the ride sharing uh, apps that are out now, if you don't have connectivity, there is no business. That's a difference between business, between technology in the business versus technology or digital as the business. Let's do one other definition. What is a business model? Um, it's also a word that's overused. Um, let me describe to you how I describe what a business model is. A business model is how a company generates revenue based on what assets they leverage to make that money. So it's based on the assets that you use to make it. And what you will see is that I believe there are only four. A lot of companies try to complicate it. It isn't. There are only four business models and ways for a company to make money. So what's the answer? I'll give you the conclusion up front. Corporate value, and I've been watching this for 20 some odd years, is shifting to business models. I chose every single word carefully. Corporate value, that's predicated by what the public markets are paying for corporations by the price of their stock, is shifting to business models that use less physical assets and they leverage technology as the business versus in or supporting the business. That's what's been happening. These are the four business models based on the four assets that a company can leverage. Go bottom left. We call them asset builders. They leverage physical assets, so industrials, hospitals, hotels. People assets, service providers, consultants, financial services, so I will add in financial, so people and financial assets. Insurance companies, another example. And I'll just stop for a minute. Those two, physical and human, or human is still physical, right? So they're physical. The, what's the key metric that we look at in the operation of these business? It's a utilization because you have something. And the only way you make money is high utilization of it. If your factory's not running at least two shifts, you're not making money. If your hospital, if your hotel doesn't have high enough occupancy, you're not making money. In the financial services industry, if our people aren't busy enough, you're not making money. You get past a certain threshold and you almost start printing money. Then you move above the digital divide and you have technology creators which are leveraging intellectual or IP-based assets or customer and interaction assets that network orchestrators, where the asset that they're leveraging is they figured out how to monetize a network. The top left model is basically think about it as a franchisor or a li any kind of a licensing model. Now, what's interesting about each one of these business models is how they scale and why they scale the way that they do. So think about them this way, down the bottom, asset builders. Make one, sell one. For every one that that business wants to sell, they have to make it. Make one, sell one. Service providers, same thing. You want to bill an hour, you have to hire an hour. We tend to hire them in 2,000 hour increments. Can't sell from an empty cart. Technology creator, make it once, invent it. Biotechnology, drug formula, software, a franchisor. Make it once sell it many times for relatively low incremental cost to do that. Or create a platform, a network, in most cases now it's a technology-based network, where other people buy and sell and trade. 
very different business models and how they scale is dramatically different. So just think about earnings calls, um, think about um, any of these businesses relative to how fast do they grow. So if you're in the bottom business here, you're growing probably a good quarter is like we had four or five, maybe 6%, 6% would be unbelievable growth. Service providers, uh, high single digits, maybe 10 or 11%. Um, you do not see, and, these, and when I'm using these numbers, I'm using mature businesses, so companies that have been around. <clears throat> they can't, you, we, we can't scale our business more than 10 or 11%. We hit a couple of 12s and then it's followed by an eight. It's just really hard. In, in, in um, Deloitte in the US, uh, we hire 20,000 people a year and we lose, I don't know what the number is, you know, 16. I mean, just think, that's a very difficult business model. But if you're successful and you invent something really good, think of how fast it can scale. What's interesting is you can actually align each one of these business models against an economic revolution. You have the industrial revolution that brought many countries out of the agrarian age. Services, but now there's not only these being um, created, but wealth shifted during these times. So, and, and let's just think about where the wealth was, and let's use a, a simple uh, example. People's pictures on covers of magazines. Most of the wealthy people in the world became wealthy as a result of building something, right? And it was, the, it was the wealth of what they built. So what do you have in the industrial revolutions? You have the industrialists. You have the railroad barons, the shipping magnets. The services industry, I don't think, ever really made a ton of money. But what happened in that revolution was many manufacturers determined that we could actually build a different business model, which is we can service what we build, and we could actually service what our competitors build as well. And you could build that business model with less capital and would grow faster. But everything really changed in the 1990s with the information revolution, where the people that created that at that time were worth hundreds of millions of dollars. But something shifted one more time, and you see how we're going from hard assets to softer assets, assets inside the corporation, controlled by the corporation, outside the corporation, because in about 2010, you have the 30-year-old billionaires creating that much value. Now, all of the work that I'll show you is based on the US S&P 500 over 40 years. This happens to be a chart put together by Ocean Tomo that is admittedly 300 of the 500. So it's not the entire S&P 500, but it's 300 of the 500. It is the more tech-oriented portions of it. Look at the value. In 1975, 83% of the value of the collective corporations was on the balance sheet. For any of the finance people in the room, what's on the balance sheet? Historically paid for assets, net of liabilities. What happened? We, we intuitively know that this is true, but the value of a corporation is no longer on its books because it exists in the intellectual capital and that's what the markets are paying for. The markets aren't paying for real estate anymore. They're not paying for machinery and factories and inventory. They're paying for knowledge and know-how. So I have a few what I call money slides. One was the four business models based on the assets that are being leveraged. This is the second one, which is, well, what are they worth? So if you look at it, look at it as a multiple of revenue, if, by and large, you make things, you're worth one times revenue. If you provide a service, it's two, four, and eight times revenue. Now, if you did this based on the US public markets today, the numbers would be a little bit bigger. The important thing is not the number, but the relative difference. And in each one of these boxes, there is a distribution curve, there's outliers, 
the more tech-based companies that make more tech-based products but are still making products, they can have a revenue multiplier of four. It doesn't change the fact that they're still asset builders that still focus on utilization. They just make expensive things with IP embedded in them. Our colors, we always use the same color, so if you just, I'll go, if I can, can I go back one slide? There we go. Notice the colors there, so then you can just, the colors will follow through. So look at the composition of the S&P 500 since 1975. It says that the asset builders are becoming less over time. That means they're dropping out of the 500. I don't know if they're going away, but they're just not in the 500s. That means 501, 502, right? You see the service providers, you see the technology creators, and you see just the beginning of the network orchestrators. Everything I'm telling you is actually quite new, even though we've been talking about it for a while. But of course, we're always talking about digital and digital in the business a lot more than we are talking about digital as the business, because it just started in early 2000. This is the other money slide. This one to me is the most important slide for anybody running a business. You can take any industry, the vertical industries, and you can look at and say who occupies or is it unoccupied, the business model in that industry. Who's the asset builder? Who's the service provider? Who's the technology creator? Who's the network orchestrator? Now, we're running a master class tomorrow. We're going to spend a lot more time on this, but let me just do a simple one for you. Let's do one that we all recognize, the travel and hospitality industry. So the last time you traveled, when you chose where you were going to stay, did you find out who built the building? Um, did you care who owned the building? Did you care who provided the catering and cleaned your room and made sure that you know everything was tidy for yourself. You probably cared about the brand. You might have actually made your selection based on the brand. It's probably where most of us did. But about over the last decade, you didn't have to go to the brand anymore, did you? You could go to somebody else that inserted themselves using a piece of technology between the existing service providers or providers the existing players in the industry, and the customer. They came in right in between and said, you know what, none of the bottom three really matters, or if you even do care about the, 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 the top one of technology creators, just book it through me. And how much are those companies valued, and what is their, multi what is their value as a multiple of revenue compared to these? It plays right out. So we're going to spend some more time on this tomorrow for those that are going to be in the master class about understanding how industries can be deconstructed and the existing players can be put there. And so then we ask this question, two by two. We've been doing a, a number of two by twos today. One of the two by twos is fuse and bang. How long is the fuse and how big will the bang be with respect to somebody taking a digital-based business model and inserting themselves between you and the customer and saying, everything underneath there may be less valuable. Now, we can also talk about how much everything has changed. Oh, you know, life's, life's difficult. There's all this technological change. But, you know, some things never change. One thing that never changes is that the public markets pay for the promise of future growth. It's that simple. The reason why many of these companies are so highly valued is because they have business models that grow. So if you can give an investor confidence about what your growth will look like, they will pay you more. And if you can say, my business model grows at 20% instead of 6%, they're going to pay you more. It's pretty simple. When a retailer says, I'm going to make a, um, a, a, a growth plan by expanding and building more stores in another country, the analysts say, great, let me know when you get past the environmentalists, you build your buildings, you fill it with inventory, you hire all the people, customers come in, and you start getting some cash, because I'm, I'm going to treat you like a bond. Or when a business model, let's say like um, stre a streaming service, says I'm going to move into another um, geography, 
on the announcement the stock can go up? Or how about one of these big tech companies, I try not to talk names because I get in trouble with my quality people. Um, another, how about a $90 billion network orchestrator? $90 billion in revenue growing at 20% a year. Stop and think about that. How the heck does a big company that's $90 billion in annual revenue grow 20%? It's not with a business model that says make one, sell one. <clears throat> but as was said earlier today, a, a lot of the challenge is in, is in the mental model. And so what we do is we like to say that how you think, right, your mental model, which is what leadership believes is important, has developed in its own skills, gives time and attention to what they measure and what they report, that drives the business model. That drives how they spend and make money, how they hire, who they hire, what they use and how they use technology, and how they actually engage with customers physically, technologically, whatever. And then that drives your performance and value, which is ultimately your revenue growth, your profitability, and your enterprise. So I like to say sometimes with a little bit of tongue in cheek, tell me what you believe, and I will tell you what you're worth. It's really simple. So let's go back to the top 10 slide and the Darwin comment. So what did the companies on the left lack with respect to letting other companies come and take the top 10 positions. It's interesting because we call, um, in the articles that we've written in the book that we're working on, is called The Great Race. I mentioned earlier this bifurcation in value. The race is to mix four business models into your business. The question is, who's going to win the race? Is it going to be people beneath the digital divide that become more tech-oriented and build different business models beyond making their business better, faster, cheaper using digital technologies, but actually building new business models, becoming software companies, becoming network orchestrators? We're going to talk tomorrow about examples of companies that are beginning to do this, some that have succeeded, some that have failed. Are they going to do that, or are the tech-based, more physical asset light companies going to win the race by buying up or creating, normally they would buy, physical infrastructure companies that they need? And so this race is who's, who's going to win it, but I, I, know, I know what the answer is. The answer is equilibrium of some sort of the mix. The question is who's going to die along the way? And the advantages that the companies on the left have, all the traditional businesses, is they have every single possible advantage. They do have capital. They have super, super important domain, knowledge, and expertise. And they're connected into the ecosystems of customers and vendors and the whole deal. This is their only problem. There's some other ones too, but this is the big one. And the other ones are practical issues around capital markets and the like. Uh, and trust. Or you have the companies on the right hand side that have high stock prices, great capital, quick thinking, they're, they're digital natives as we call them. They didn't have to learn it, they just, that is just who they are. And they're quick and they can move fast, but they don't have all of that domain experience. Who's going to win? So markets have bifurcated value between tangible and intangible assets. This race is brewing. Companies above and below are in the race. Some companies are starting to make progress. The opportunity is greater in some industries rather than others based on where the fuse and the bomb is. Businesses that will attract the most value will be those that see the opportunity to reallocate capital, to invest in multiple business models, and win the great company race. So if you agree that there is a difference in value based on these concepts of, of a business model based on how a company scales. If you believe that a dollar of revenue doesn't always equal a dollar of value, some pieces, some dollars of revenue are worth more, then what does this mean for countries? 
So what we said was, well, let's see. It's an eye chart, but think about it as a Van Gogh. Just step back and look. Where you see green, there's green. Where you see red, there's red. That's all you need to see. Correlation. What it says is that we studied 68% of global GDP over seven years with three different studies. Up on the left, 2015 to 17, 13 to 15, 10 to 13. So a three-year period, a two-year period, and a two-year period. And what it basically said is that countries that have four business models in their economy and support four business models, the economy grows. Countries that don't, that, su that support, I'm sorry, that don't do all four, but instead focus on the ones that have been around for 100 years, focus on manufacturing and service industries, to the exclusion of the other two, their economies shrink. It's interesting, we were surprised by it because we thought one might grow more than the other, but no, it's actual, sorry for the overuse of the term, it's digital, a zero or a one. It's either you grow or you don't. And then there's only a couple of areas where the greens and the reds don't equal each other, and you could pick them out for some pretty obvious reasons like Abenomics in Japan or Brexit in the UK. Here's an easier way to look at it. There are the countries that are doing well with respect to that, and the size of their economies are based on the size of the balls, and if they're growing, they're green and up. And some of the countries that don't do as well or that actually flip-flop over the period of time. Um, <clears throat> here's uh, just, it, just a little bit of detail behind it, just for your reading pleasure, um, that talks about some of the key parameters that are analyzed when we give the gradings to these different countries. And then you notice on this slide here, see how the colors are hard colors, there's no transition between the greens and all that, that's because it, it's based on a calculation that we did versus this is a little bit more subjective to talk about their actual regulatory frameworks underneath that either do or don't support in some of the things that we looked at, like e-commerce, retail penetration, taxi e-hailing adoption, fintech emergence, social media, IP protection. And then just for fun, there's actually 74 of these. These are 15 of 74 different ways that we can benchmark one country against another. So the great country race is that corporate values have shifted to intangible assets. New business models that leverage these intangible assets are highly valued. The creation of businesses using these new business models correlates to GDP growth. Leaders can enable new tech-based business model creation. These insights can help guide country leaders to contemporize the policies to support the creation of four business models. And the economies that dominate tomorrow's landscape will likely be those whose leaders balance the support for all four business models. Those that remain focused on older business models are likely to fall behind. So if then, what about, what are we teaching our business class students? Old stuff. So remember the colors I told you? Dark, blue and green, depending on how it came on on this screen, means the two business models beneath the digital divide. So if you look around the globe in the countries that we studied, what you see is predominantly we are still teaching old business model in the schools. So what we decided to do was we said, well, because uh, we're in the U.S., because the U.S. is the largest economy, because it's the most transparent and has the most information, Let's go figure out if we did a deep dive into the US, do we learn anything in there? And what we looked at was across full-time executive management education and engineering education less than 10% above the digital divide was being taught. That there is, however, some minor correlation in economic clusters. Um, and so here, again, just, you know, there's a lot of information. Just if you look, you, the, the very top line is GDP growth. You see the six or seven, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the eight different uh, clusters in the U.S. Go down to the bottom here, and you see kind of, okay, here's all the different metrics. There's what it is. And then if you look down here, what you see is to the left of the red line, it's 10%. To the right of the, of the 
uh, red line other than Austin, it's 5%. So I don't know if it's right, right? I don't know, is it, is it, is it to say that those economic regions that have invested twice as much, 5% to 10%, twice as much in new education content, they're doing better. I don't know if five to 10 is enough, but there's some minimal correlation there. The bigger message is across the world, we're not. It's a problem. So the alignment of business, education, and government, I think, will be key to drive a nation's wealth. That business leaders need to create tech-based business models and integrate them with their core businesses. The educators need to build new education content and integrate it with the existing education content. And government leaders can work with the business leaders and the education content in order to drive it through regulation, policy, and keep it all together. And therefore, nations that build the greatest wealth will likely be those that can successfully integrate the adoption of the four business models, modernize education content, and provide a conducive regulatory environment. Those that won't will fall behind. <clears throat> so to me, in summary, um, there is a race. There's a company race. There's a country race. And when you throw in the education component, there's a race to build wealth in the countries and in the different nations. What will be required for that transformation to occur is people to put these four business models together and move beyond the past. And with that, I'll take some questions. How are we doing on time? I didn't look. We uh, thank you, Bill Rubaldo. We have a, a few moments only. Uh, one question I do have, though. It's not something you've covered so far, but it's actually because we're here today at this Ortelius conference. How, where does Ortelius and Inrigo and the DTO fit in to all of this? So it's interesting. I was, um, I was speaking at a technology conference. I was actually there uh, Thursday of this past week. Um, and I think it was two years ago, maybe three years ago, um, and at the same conference. And I was being interviewed by the BBC and um, uh, Orvin, um, the chief legal officer and, and business development executive uh, from Ortelius, heard the uh, interview and said to Ulf, um, he's talking about the kind of si similar stuff that we're doing and we're building systems around, you know, you guys should connect together. It took us a while, but we did. So we've been working together now for a couple of years. And uh, one of the things that uh, we spent some time on and um, Ulf and his team has, has built for us um, to use with our clients is what is a capital allocation model. So what we found for a number of companies, um, once they got past the debate internally at their executive team, once they got past the, 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 the debate that we want to do something and we want to go digital, the second debate was how much money should we spend? And then the third debate was are we spending it where we need to spend it? And so we built this capital allocation model that allows a tool that integrates with the um, Ortelius platform in Arigo. Um, it, it allows a company to pick a time period. So you could say, what did we do last year? You could say, what's in our plan this year? Or you could say, what's in our three-year plan or whatever? Take all of the capital, all of your discretionary spending, however you want to define it, and put it into a system that will allocate it by the four business models. Would it be helpful to understand that we think we're going digital, but we're actually not spending any money above the digital divide because all of the digital stuff we're doing is supporting the two existing business models, which you have to do, but if you don't move up above. And so version one of that is done. Um, version two of it will um, actually blend that internal view with an external view, which says, okay, let's identify your competitors your traditional competitors, that's easy. Let's, let's identify your non-traditional competitors, the ones that are maybe going to come in from the side that are going to blindside you, and let's see how they're doing. So that, yes, maybe now we've solved question one. Are we spending enough money going digital, and what kind of progress are we making? But that's still an internal view. 
Now let's view it compared to our competitors, traditional and non, that says, well, great, maybe we're making two steps forward, but somebody else is making four, and so we've actually moved back one. Thank you for that answer. So I guess your core message, among many wonderful messages, is that allocate funds, allocate money, allocate, allocate resources and well, ambitions to become more digital. Yeah, there's some, there's some pretty good studies that have done, been done by other consulting organizations that have looked at uh, corporate management's uh, capital allocation. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. You can say this. Uh, I'll say it one way. It's not that I believe only this way, but one way to say it is that management teams are in their position to do not much more than allocate capital. Shareholders say you have X amount of capital, allocate it and provide me a return. If you provide me a good return, I'll give you, I'll, I'll want to buy more of your stock and it goes up. So if management's job is just to allocate capital, then you have to ask yourself a question, how are you doing? And if you don't allocate capital right, and you allocate it to the wrong pieces of your business, you're not going to do right. You'll be on the left-hand side of that column in 10 or 20 years and not on the right-hand side of that column. Bill Ribaudo, thank you so much for coming to Sweden once more. My and pleasure. you're staying tomorrow. Thank you so thank much. You.